So let's talk about some of the oftentimes confusing terminology um, of the governmental groups that influence the management of our coastal zones. So it often seems like a big um, acronym soup, a big rando jump bunch of letters, and things that are more familiar maybe aren't confusing, but inevitably at some point this semester we'll come across some agency or some group and they'll have a funky funky acronym, so I want to make sure you guys have heard these. Um, I'm just going to hit the ones that are most commonly in, uh, that we might engage with in the context of coastal management um, here in, in California, but realize theoretically any agency, any, any international body, any, any state agency, whatever could theoretically impact the management of the coast. We're just talking about the popular ones. Um, one general uh, rough rule of thumb, this doesn't always apply, but generally speaking, local agencies tend to be uh, more specialized. So the, the district that's going to regulate uh, mariculture in the county or something of that nature, right? Pretty tight mission, pretty focused um, uh, orientation, pretty specialized usually. And as we start to go to larger geographic areas, that specialty becomes a bit more fuzzy and it becomes a bit more generic um, and less focused on one particular topic or one particular skill set. Um, federal agencies are a bit uh, kind of fall into both extremes. So there are some federal agencies that are hyper specialized, say um, the pipeline transportation agency that only deals with pipelines, or it could be something like the Department of Interior with a very broad mandate. And generally speaking, this is how stuff is nested. Um, so we're going to be at our local jurisdiction, which is usually a city or town. Sometimes there's even a special district within a town, but usually this is how it goes. City or town, say Camarillo, that is nested within the authority of the county. And what I mean by nested is that, that the, the, the higher up usually... If, if there's a question of who's in charge and it, it's coming down to who's, you know, me or you, it's usually the, the one that's higher up on the list that sort of um, wins the day, usually. Not always, but usually. So city or town. And then we have uh, county in most of the U.S., except for Louisiana, where we'd have parish, but say, equivalent to the same thing. Uh, and then we have uh, special districts in California. So special districts are are interesting. Sometimes they're nested within the, the, the county, but really they, they are mostly um, uh, commissioned from the state level. So meaning, that whereas the town, the influence of that particular agency is the geographic boundaries of the town, the influence of the county is the geographic boundaries of the county, the special districts are funky and that they, are, they don't fit any other uh, jurisdiction. They're not the state, so they don't have jurisdiction over the whole state. They're not a county. Maybe it's less than a county, or maybe it's greater than a county, um, and less than a town or more than a town. If the geographic jurisdiction matched one of the normal political domains, you wouldn't need to create a special district. So examples of special district would be something like mosquito abatement, a um, uh, uh, group that might that might you know mostly work in Ventura County, but it might spill over into uh, Los Angeles County, right? It, but also maybe it wouldn't be the whole of Ventura County. It would be maybe like the the Conejo Valley Mosquito Abatement Control District or something like that. Similarly, things such as recreational districts. A lot of times, the recreational districts might be um, say less than a county, and it, they might include some cities, but then go outside of some cities, but not apply to other parts of the county, et cetera. So we have city, town, uh, county, special districts, and then the state. And then we might have some interstate agreements. So for example, we have the Western States uh, Governors Alliance, which is California, Oregon, Washington. Um, and, and so we have sometimes agreements to, to share resources and have have policy guidance and things of that nature. Um, not, not, not a whole lot of those, but they, there are some things that exist. Uh, and then, of course, we have the federal government. 
That's the main thing. Um, we may have some things beyond the federal government, and so these would be treaties into which we've, um, this is not the UN governing body, blah, 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 right? This, these are treaties that we've signed and agreed to. So this isn't somebody coming in from outside saying you do this. These are specific agreements that we've made. And we said, hey, if you guys do that, we'll do this. And so, for example, um, uh, uh, what used to be called uh, NAFTA, now USTA, which is, um, governs the trade between Mexico, the United States of America, and Canada. Right, so those rules are um, are managed uh, um, by that that group, even though they might be enforced by the federal government. Let's say um, they're really um, beholden to that that um, uh, the set of rules that are beyond um, necessarily the federal. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, do they supersede town? That's a good question. So. Um, Normally, everybody plays nicely with each other. And so normally, like let's say the case of the mosquito, con mosquito abatement district, the town likes the fact that we're dealing with the mosquitoes, right? The town likes the fact that they don't have to have that on their docket, that somebody else is taking care of it for me. So, so they're like, go for it, dude. Where it would come into, where it would start to become an issue would be if, let's say, um, we wanted to go put some... Uh, bacillus toxin in the pond of some wealthy person's property, right? And they, they suddenly decide they don't want anybody to come on their property. And they're like, no, 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 no. And so the uh, abatement district goes, okay, well then could you please do some something to manage the mosquitoes on your property? And they go, you can't tell me what to do. And then you start to face off. And those guys might go to the, maybe they supported somebody for the, the town council. And, and so, and so maybe they would go to that the advocate and go, "Hey, man, these guys are telling me what to do on my property." And so, so that would that would tend to be litigated. Another another example, maybe a more a tangible coastal example, is the ongoing, ongoing struggles um, that the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, which is a special district, it's 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 called the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, began in the Santa Monica Mountains, Los Angeles, Ventura County. Um, but has since become massive. So now it includes places all around Ventura County, Simi Valley, Antelope Valley, um, even are managing or helping manage some parks in Orange County, all across urban Los Angeles. I mean, so it's a, it's a large area. Uh, it's a large special district about creating parks and protecting areas, um, creating recreational opportunities, that, that kind of stuff, managing wildfire, stuff like that. So that's a special district. How do I say this next part? Um, the city of Malibu likes to do what the city of Malibu likes to do. Um, and so there's a uh, ongoing disagreement about things like access to the beach. And so um, the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, which is a sister agency, um, and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy have worked to, um, in partnership to, for example, create more coastal access, more ability of people to go to the beach, find a beach, see that this is a, a publicly accessible area. And so they've put up signs, for example, that say, hey, this is, this is um, you know, the, here, here's how you can get to the to the coast, to the beach. And the city of Malibu has come through and cut off those signs and said, nope, those signs are dangerous, quote unquote. And so then the signs have been put back up and then within a day or two, they've been cut back down by the city. And so that's a direct challenge between a city town level and the special district. And they disagree, so, so they have overlapping geographies and one in each says the other is not behaving legally, that, that the other has the authority to, one, put up signs to point people to recreational sites. The other says, oh, no, 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 that's, that's a danger to the public. Um, and so that's being litigated in court right now. 
So, um, so generally speaking, it seems like the special districts have authority, um, but uh, uh, it, it, in this particular case about coastal access and signs, that's not been tested in court. So we don't know the actual legal answer yet. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I would say that all the stuff, th these bottom three are all what we would consider local or local government. Okay, so examples of these, as, as I just mentioned some of these, so things like watershed protection or flood control districts, vector control districts, a harbor and port districts, uh, uh, Port Wanimi um, is one of the, has one of those. Um, uh, and, and in some cases, these districts are like a special district. So in the case of Port Wanimi, it's its own thing. It has its own elected representatives. It's its own deal. It, it raises its own money. It's, it's autonomous. Other places like the Port of Los Angeles is controlled by the city uh, and or county of Los, of Los Angeles. And so it's not an autonomous thing. It's an arm of another part of government. Um, uh, air and water districts, resource conservation districts, um, uh, county agricultural offices, sanitation districts, etc. Um, okay, so these special districts, which are ones that I just want to touch on because they there's many of them, and they're thing I think things that most people don't know about, or many of you guys haven't heard about these things. So uh, they're a little bit funky, and so like that example I just mentioned of. Um, uh, providing coastal access or, or encouraging coastal access um, is, is maybe, uh, maybe a classic case. So the idea is um, this special district is quote unquote independent from the county, let's say, right? The county can't tell them what to do. And as I just mentioned, um, the, the, port, the, the, the governing entity that, that manages Port Wainimi is an example of this, right? So the county might really encourage them. To, and, and, and I'm not saying, and this is not like a you know, football game or something like somebody pushing on one side and the other side. It's almost, <clears throat> it's almost always collegial and collaborative. It's, it's, it's rare when, when we, have, we butt heads. Again, so normally we're all rowing in the same direction. Um, but in the case of the Harbor District, um, the county can't control them, right? If they wanted to raise fees or they wanted to put a, a parklet in the middle of the thing, like they could just do it, right? Essentially, I mean, they'd have to get the, the building permits and stuff, but, but the county doesn't get to dis determine. Um, they might consult with them. If they're being collegial. Hey, what do you guys think about this? And they might give some feedback, but they're, they're an autonomous um, thing. Uh, then we have other special districts which are dependent on the particular uh, overarching uh, political uh, geography. And so, for example, that would be something like, um, uh, it's a special district, but all of its funding, let's say, or, or, or um, other resources uh, come from that other entity. So they might have some independence but if they go really, if they go really, you know, sideways, the, the group would just cut off their budget, let's say. And so they, they're not really um, independent, quote unquote. These, these, where they get their money from are two broad categories. One is um, enterprise, which is um, these guys might sell some services, right? Or, or if, if you want our services, you need to pay a fee and then, you know, they raise money essentially that way. Um, more commonly, it's something like um, uh, money from taxes, right? So, so hey, you're in this area and you're going to pay an extra 20 bucks a month or a year or whatever, and that 20 bucks per household or per whatever property owner or whatever the heck um, is going to go into our fund, and that's going to be our operating budget to do whatever we need to do. Okay. Examples of state agencies include things like the State Lands Commission, which is the entity that many people haven't heard of, but is the thing that controls all, for example, underwater leases. So, so if we want to put a, a mooring can out to tie up your boat, you have to essentially lease the bottom of the ocean from the state, and the State Lands Commission is the entity that, that controls that. Uh, Ocean Protection Council, um, and they've since, uh, since they've been created, they've spun off a thing called the Ocean Science Trust, which is a funky thing. That is not 
a state agency. That is a, that is a special nonprofit, the Ocean Science Trust. The Ocean Protection Council is a state agency. So for example, when a colleague of mine who um, followed the science and voted a certain way on a particular issue, the governor didn't like it, so he was let go. He was, the executive director was, was sacked because it's a political organization and it's, and they, and it's a, an arm of the, um, of, of the administration. Um, Coastal Commission, we've talked about the Coastal Commission, uh, uh, Department of Food and Agriculture, Department of Transportation, which we normally call Caltrans, uh, business and economic development, tourism, uh, et cetera. So an example of, of uh, so again, I'm trying to show you here, sometimes these groups that seem to be doing the same thing um, maybe have different hats or different subgroups. So they all might be rowing the same way, but there might be a foundation or a trust or a nonprofit and then the state agency. And so we see that with things like state parks. There's a state parks and there's a state parks foundation, right? So they're all, they're all interested in state parks. One can raise money and, and do that kind of stuff. The other can only get money through taxes and, and fees, for example. Uh, other example of important state agencies would be something like the uh, Cal EPA. Nested underneath Cal EPA is the Office of Environmental uh, Health Hazards Assessment, um, uh, the Department of Toxic Substances, we were talking about um, pollution uh, the other day, and so the Department of Toxic Substances is the sort of lead agency on, on, on things like that. Uh, the State Water Board, State Air, Resor Air Resources Board, which is usually referred to as CARB for California Air Resources Board. CARB, incredibly important agency because they, um, in addition to just dealing with pollution, air pollution, which is a huge task, they also um, are the lead agency that have come to set the many of the policy, uh, much of the policy tone and the stuff related to carbon emissions. So, um, so they are a, a, a powerful entity. Um, okay, so let's talk about how some of these districts are organized. So these are state level districts. And so in both the case of water districts and air districts, um, the state has been carved up into some operational unit. So on the left, these are our water, so, so there's, there's one, the state water board. There's one, the state air board, CARB, right? So there's these overarching entities that sort of are the, the, the big marching orders for where we're trying to go as a state, okay? Usually they're the entities that also uh, give grants out, money out to do projects. Okay, then nested within there are the districts. The individual districts is where the rubber meets the road. That's where we do the measurement, that's where we do enforcement and that kind of stuff. So in the case of water districts, we have these water districts that are broken up roughly into sort of a similar geographies in terms of the management challenge. So there's coastal and there's inland, and, um, and the geographies generally match the, the, the topography. So it's either Sierra Nevadas, or it's the desert, that kind of stuff. And so note, the, the, note the, the, um, these, are, these don't really follow county uh, boundaries, right? So an air, so a water district might include um, uh, several counties potentially within it, or parts of several counties. Okay, then we can talk about uh, air districts. So air districts um, uh, tend to more closely map to our counties, but again, it's not necessarily 100% uh, onto a county. For state agencies, um, we have a big sort of parent mothership, which is our uh, natural resources agency. And then within these, there's all these other groups. So, so a lot of times we think of these guys as agencies, but they're actually nested within the mama, uh, the mothership. Uh, so this includes things like the Coastal Conservancy, which is the entity that's mostly gonna acquire land, uh, uh, grants to, to buy land and and say do a restoration, et cetera. Remember the Coastal Conservancy is a sort of administrative policy type of arm. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, routinely give out grants or, or things like that to acquire land or to do stuff. So Co Coastal Conservancy is a partner agency with the Coast Commission, but they're a, a discrete thing. And very few people recognize them and people often confuse them with the Coastal Conservancy, uh, um, um, with the uh, Coastal Commission, excuse me as I just did right there. <laughs> There's an example. Uh, okay, um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, which for years and years and years was called Department of Fish and Game. 
And so usually people call, just called it um, a CDFG. Then under uh, Governor Brown, the last time Governor Brown was in office, he decided that fishing game, so, so this, 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 this name re references extraction, right? So fish or fish, things that we, we eat, and game or animals that we hunt. Um, the idea was, hey, that, that, that's a, a non-ideal description of wildlife. So we changed to fish and wildlife, which you know, theoretically sounds nice, but now it's the same name as the federal agency, US Fish and Wildlife Service. So it used to be very easy in California, it's fish and game, and we're talking about the state folks, it's fish and wildlife, and it's the, it's the feds. Now it gets, now it's confusing, because so you, you have to say the extra state or feds, and, and it's, it's, it was easier when, when they had a more distinct name. There's the Fish and Game Commission, which is the uh, uh, body of people that actually pass the laws. How many fish can we take out of the water this year? What's the, what, when's the hunting season gonna open? That kind of stuff. Uh, Wildlife Conservation Board, another really important organization for, for land protection that nobody really knows about. They, again, give out a lot of money and help with a lot of the um, logistics of acquiring, say, parkland and things of that nature. Um, the California Energy Commission, or CEC, um, San Francisco Bay Conservation Development Commission. This is one that we don't really interact with down here, but again, this is that, I, I mentioned that the, the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Act, applies to ev the coastal areas except for the Bay Area. This is the entity that deals with the, that, those same issues inside the internal part, the coastline of the San Francisco Bay. Department of Conservation, and one that we'll touch on in a, in a little bit is um, their, um, their, uh, one of their important agencies for us that we'll talk about what used to be known as DOGGER, or the acronym was DOGGER, and has since been uh, changed to uh, the California Energy Management Division, or CALGEM, uh, Geological Energy Management, GEM. Um, that's the entity that's going to um, keep track of uh, all that kind of stuff, oversight, on our oil and gas wells. Uh, parks and Recreation, or otherwise known as state parks. Um, CalFed, which we don't, again, deal with much down here, but that's, a, a, that's an interesting one. It's a, it's a state-federal partnership to better manage the San Francisco Bay Delta. Um, the, the entity that's used to be known as California Forestry and Fire, born up originally to manage California's forests, and then also, by the way, we should probably also deal with fire. Now fire has grown to be the vast, the vast, 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 vast amount of the portfolio of this agency, and indeed, now it's just known as Cal Fire. So, um, so uh, we mostly encounter them in the context of wildfires. Uh, California Boating and Waterways, Department of Water Resources. Uh, and oh, yeah, I didn't say that before, but let me say it again. Uh, these guys that are gray um, are, uh, don't necessarily have a pure coastal focus. Coastal is in their portfolio, but they do a lot of other stuff. Whereas the beige lettering are things that are primarily focused in the marine or coastal zone. No. So the question is, okay, so, so, so are, are Cal Fire the, um, uh, the rangers? No, the rangers would be that particular uh, land ownership. So if it's state parks, it would be state parks. If it's feds, it would be federal rangers. Um, there are also count, uh, local folks. Like, so for example, we have um, uh, uh, Conejo Parks and Recreation Districts have a ton of rangers around, sort of near around campus and stuff like that. So yeah, no, so, so these guys, so when I say forestry, these are folks that are managing the forest. They're not, they're not um, uh, dealing with the public per se. So they're more like policies for how we uh, uh, sell timber and things like that. Okay, a few examples of the interstate agreements. Um, so our UNOL's fleet, uh, I just was having a conversation with somebody the other day. I can't remember how many UNOL's fleet ships we have, I think the guess was like 12? I don't know if that's still right. So this is an agreement um, uh, between states. And so uh, this is, now we don't, we don't have this, but large marine, 
Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. 18. I love it. Good get. So there's currently 18 uh, vessels in the UNOS fleet. So this is, this is for large research universities um, that uh, just like, like we have our Santa Rosa Island Research Station. Other universities have research stations. Um, we do not have a ocean-going research vessel, but some entities do, right? Actually, we, we actually partly do in, in the consortium that we're a part of. We have access to one down in San Pedro. But, but um, uh, so these would be ships that, let's say, would be able to do large net tows to study fisheries or, um, or geological uh, survey vessels, um, stuff like that. Go to Antarctica, stuff like that. And so they're domiciled at a particular university. So they might be at Louisiana State University, they might be in Florida, uh, they might be at UC San Diego, something like that. Um, but they all share a common governance. And so, so, it's, so they all have, like, so the, the employees that are there are all trained to the same standard, the, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so the acronym that people say is UNOLS. Is that a UNOLS boat? And it has a standard rate um, for like how much it costs per, per day to use it. Another one I mentioned before is the West Coast Governor's Agreement on Ocean Health. And so that's our, our three states along the Pacific Coast of California. Um, we also have the West Coast Ocean Tribal Caucus for um, First Nation peoples um, in terms of getting together and having more agency, more voice, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, for example, the Western Electric Electricity Coordinating Council that deals with moving electricity over the Western grids. So those are examples of interstate agreements and then we get to our feds. So the federal agencies, first thing we should talk about is the, the uh, most obvious one we talk about the feds in the ocean or the coast is NOAA or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. For historic reasons, because ocean going trade was so important when this agency was being stood up, it is located in the Department of Commerce unlike most of the agencies that we deal with in ESRM that are in sort of a science agency, uh, a land management agency, something like that, these guys are, are, are solidly within the Department of Commerce. Um, and so underneath NOAA, NOAA is a huge organization, tons and tons of different things that it does, um, weather and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, but, but the ones that are most important to us are the National Marine Fisheries Service, this name has changed, and I don't even know, it's, it's changed so many times and flip flopped. I don't even know what the right acronym is these days. So when I went to school, and you guys, everybody called them NIMFs. So nobody said their full name, they all said it's NIMFs. So National Marine Fisheries Service. About, about, I don't know, a decade or so ago, there was this new policy spin, and again, uh, you need, so you can tell the, the, the terminology is going to reflect the political winds at the time. So these folks are like, no, we really want to emphasize that we do fisheries. So we don't want anybody to call us nymphs anymore. Like you go to meetings, and say, don't call us nymphs, call us Noah Fisheries. And we're like, okay. And that lasted for a few years. Now I think people are back to using nymphs, but, but whatever. It, uh, the entity, this is the thing that's going to manage fish stocks in federal waters. Um, uh, and also the entity that's going to manage any endangered species that touch salt water. So whereas most of the endangered species we have here in Ventura County are going to be at the federal level are going to be regulated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In the case of salmon, right, in the case of our steelhead, because the steelhead touch the ocean or potentially touch the ocean if we take the dams down, um, because they touch salt water, even though they might mostly be up in the CESPI right now, the entity that's going to have sort of the, the oversight on the, their management plan is going to be NOAA. And the entity is specifically this entity within NOAA, which is the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, a office of Coastal Zone Management, a very small office, but it's set up the Coastal Zone Management. So when we start talking about those policies, um, they, this office assures that plans exist uh, in our state. In our state, it's the, the Coastal Commission that's the, the arm that does that. Uh, Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. We know our Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. They're underneath there. Um, there's also the NERS, National Estuarine Research Reserves. We have one up in San Francisco. We have one in Tijuana. Um, these are, these are um, ways of managing estuaries and monitoring them. Um, so a lot of science is done in these NERS. 
National Weather Service. The NTA is going to make all of our, essentially that thing that everybody uses, the National Weather Service. Under um, the, the previous uh, federal administration, they tried really hard to destroy this entity. And this is the thing that everybody, when you turn on the television, they're using National Weather Service data. When you look at the newspaper prediction, National Weather Service data. When you open your iPhone weather app, National Weather Service data. Everybody uses their data. But their website sucks. It's, 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 if you know how to use it, it's, you can use it. But, but it's not very graphically in interesting. It's boring. It's lame. It's, it's the opposite of something like going to the NASA website. NASA website, all these cool pictures. And let me show you how to do this. Hey, you want to sign up for this thing? Go to National... Uh, um, uh, the National Weather Service website is like, ah, here is a printout from 1988, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's by design. So there's been several efforts to make it more transparent. And folks that essentially make money off of selling forecasts to you that were very um, high up uh, most recently in the last, in the last um, U.S. administration specifically banned the Weather Service from doing good websites and doing effective, engaging public outreach. So they're banned from doing that. So they don't want, the, they want, they want them to do all the work and do all the modeling and create all the data and then have other people make money off it is the idea, which is a little crazy, but that's what's going on. Um, okay, and for us, that might sound like, oh, I wanna know the temperatures of the beach, but for farmers and fishermen, people that really, really rely on the weather for their safety and income, um, they're, th that's not a good thing. I would argue that if you, the American taxpayer, are paying for this National Weather Service. It's crazy that we have to go through a, a for-profit entity and watch a bunch of ads or something just to see the data that you paid for. But that's the, that's the system we have at the moment. Uh, National Ocean Service, uh, Office of uh, uh, Oil Spill Response and Restoration. Okay, last, uh, a few more uh, federal ones. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, obviously stuff way beyond just the coast but they do have some influence where we are, Department of Transportation, Federal EPA, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So hopefully you guys are going to come to hear Harry talk tonight at 5, um, but one of his main um, criticisms will be leveled at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They are a funky entity. They are a very funky entity. So they started with, um, the, as, their name, um, as their name implies, the Army. Okay, so when our country was young, and we needed these harbors for trade and defense and all this kind of stuff. And we're like, oh my gosh, the, the harbor is silting in. Or we need a bridge over the harbor or something like that. We need to be able to pier, right? Call in the army. And so they had the engineers at the time. So they would come in and they would, they would do the dredging or they would do the whatever activity was there. Um, as, as things have evolved, say, you know, this century, um, uh, the idea was, hey, the army still has all the engineers and they know how to build things and everything, so we should just have them do it. So it is, it is weird. It is headed by uniformed military officers, right? So they're sort of Department of Defense people. So the head is always a general. They're, they're, it's broken up into regional offices. So the head's always general. But then just about everybody else underneath that person is a civilian employee of, of the... I mean, they're a government employee, but, but they're not a military person. So it's this really weird thing. It's a very strange, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't, like today, in today's day and age, we wouldn't set it up that way, but it's sort of one of the many legacy things we have. But what that means is when they do something wrong, they're the federal government, right? So generally speaking, you can't sue the federal government for them doing something bad, generally speaking. Um... But when they do something bad and something fails, um, they walk the general out in the military uniform, right? Hey, you know, I'm an American. I live here too. I wouldn't have done anything bad. Come on, right? It should also be noted that back in the day, this is getting into what Harry's going to talk about, but, but basically back in the day, these were, as the name implies, mostly engineers, mostly physics guys, engineer folks that knew how to build how to, you know, how to, how to pour concrete and all this and that. And they did the stuff themselves. When we needed to put in the, the breakwater, they designed it themselves. That essentially is no longer the case now. Almost nobody does any design in the Army Corps of Engineers. They all ship all of the money out to consulting firms. So all of the actual planning this, 
all the actual construction. In fact, much of the oversight is done by third-party consulting firms. Uh, and just before we leave this, since we're talking about this, there's two main, two main arms of the Army Corps of Engineers. The, I, should, I should also say that um, when we were doing the big dam building uh, era, starting about 100 years ago in our country, um, we're like, hey, we want to build a dam on the Colorado River. Hey, we want to build a dam here. Hey, we want to build a... Who knows how about that? I don't know. Army Corps of Engineers. Let's have the Army Corps of Engineers build them, right? So the Army Corps of Engineers were fundamental to the, the re... Uh, piping of the hydrology of North America starting about a century ago. Now we're in the area in places like the Klamath River where we're taking out dams. We're trying to take out the Matillaha Dam. We're trying to take out um, um, you know, dams in the Santa Monica's, dams, dams in the San Francisco Bay Area, all that kind of stuff. How do we take them out? The government has decided we have to go through the Army Corps of Engineers. So the entity that put them up is also the entity in charge of taking them down, which is kind of ironic, I would say. Um, and so the Army Corps of Engineers has two main arms. One is to do that kind of stuff, construction projects. The other is compliance monitoring. So for example, wetlands, they're, one of the, they're the main entity that deals with wetland enforcement and, 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 and defining what a wetland is in the US. Okay, then we have Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Bureau of Safety and Enforcement. These both used to be underneath one single uh, office called the Minerals Management Service. After the Deepwater Horizon, they've been split apart. So one does permitting, one does enforcement, but this is for any kind of offshore energy. Oil and gas, of course, offshore wind, any tidal energy stuff, it's, it's these folks. Uh, and then FEMA, that does obviously more than just the coastal zone, but FEMA is also an important one, responding to disasters. FEMA was created in the 70s to try to pull together the, the federal response when we have a disaster. Intergovernmental agencies include UN agencies and then UN birthed agencies. So the UN agencies include things like the um, Food and Agricultural Organization based in Italy. Um, these folks pull together, amongst other things, the main data for food production across the planet. Uh, the International Maritime Organization uh, deals with shipping and, is, and provides standards for shipping. So we try to figure out how many illegal vessels are going around and all that kind of stuff. Uh, of uh, uh, standards for what kind of life rafts you have to have, that kind of stuff, International Maritime Organization. Uh, we also have the High Commissioner for Refugees that manages people oftentimes transiting across the ocean. And then we have things that aren't strictly UN, but were birthed by the UN um, and have, a, have a, relation, a tight relationship with the UN. This is the uh, IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. This is the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, the World Database of Protected Areas that maintains um, all of the uh, 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 parks and protected areas across the planet and its sister agency that deals with marine protected areas. And then things like the International Seabed Authority, which we're, we briefly touched on already, but um, we'll talk about more when we get to deep sea mining. Um, and then other examples of intergovernmental bodies that aren't the UN. And, and that didn't start there, it was, was again, uh, this like trilateral committee um, to deal with um, uh, uh, consequences of trade mostly between Canada, the US, and Mexico. The International Whaling Commission, which was created originally by the whaling community, by the, by the people that were doing whaling, because they got worried that they had so driven to extinction many of these species that they wanted to better manage them. So this was, this was the resource extractors trying to be more sustainable and, and has since been come to be seen as a conservation group by some entities um, when, they, when they made their, their moratorium on whaling uh, in, across much of the world. But that's the International Whaling Commission. We sometimes have regional fisheries management organizations. So an example of this would be the uh, tuna, some of the tuna commissions that manage tuna in the open ocean and, and again, trying to make sure we're not over, you know, driving these guys to extinction, et cetera. 